All right. Um, welcome back, everyone. Um, I have the happy task of introducing three speakers who need no introduction. Um, so I'll try to be quick. Um, our first speaker is Mateo Suarez de Azevedo, and he'll be talking on Christian perennialism and perennialist Christianity. Uh, Mateo is an author, translator, editor, and journalist specializing in comparative religion. He has written 11 books and dozens of articles and essays published in the USA, in Europe, and in Brazil. Uh, in light of his upcoming talk, uh, I should point out just one, namely that he's the editor of the anthology, Ye Shall Know the Truth, Christianity and the Perennial Philosophy, which was published in 2005. Our second speaker is our very own Brad Malkowski. Um, Brad has taught comparative theology here at Notre Dame since 1992. Um, he is past editor of the Journal of Hindu Christian Studies, and his books include The Role of Divine Grace in the Soteriology of Shankarachara and God's Other Children, Personal Encounters with Faith, Love, and Holiness in Sacred India. Brad um, is universally recognized by students and colleagues here at Notre Dame as uh, one of the best and most compassionate teachers that we have. Um, and that is, is really no exaggeration at all. Now, uh, finally, our third speaker will be Catherine Corneille, and she'll be tracing perennial philosophy and comparative theology. Catherine is professor of comparative theology at Boston College, where she holds the Newton College Alumni Chair of Western Culture. And um, the funny thing about this is, is this, uh, this title doesn't even do her justice. Um, Catherine brings her expertise in the theology of religions, in comparative theology, and of course in interreligious dialogue east and west. Um, her recent publications include Meeting and Method in Comparative Theology and Comparative Theology and Atonement, the Cross and Dialogue with Other Religions. So um, without further ado, uh, please welcome uh, Matthias. Good afternoon to everyone. I thank you for your presence here. Thanks to Professor Bradley Malkowski and Adnan Aslam for their efforts in organizing this important seminar. And I send also my greetings to all those people who are uh, following us through the internet in the Indian state, in the United States as a whole, in Canada, Brazil, Argentina, Portugal, Switzerland, Poland, Iran, Egypt, and Turkey. And uh, so we, we, and Australia as well. <laughs> uh, I, I believe that uh, uh, there are much more people following us uh, through the internet than in here. And uh, so we have to take this into account uh, as well. Uh, I thank you that are, are here. I see many friendly faces. And uh, the title of my presentation is uh, Christian Spirituality, Believing Intellectuals and the Perennial Philosophy. I, I start with a very important and central operative or practical topic of both the perennial philosophy and the Christian religion, which is prayer of the heart. Prayer of the heart. The name itself, the concept itself, seems to me beautiful, doubly beautiful, as it brings together two powerful realities, 
prayer, which is communication with God. It is elevation of the mind to the realm of the absolute and the infinite. It is stillness, silence, contemplation. As the Council of Trent put it, man's prayer ascends and God's mercy descends. God hears the voice of man. This is from the Council of Trent. And the heart, which is the element in us that is most profound, inward, and universal. As the physical heart bombs blood or life to the extremities of our organism, so the spiritual heart blows the spirit throughout our being. In uh, the Christian religion, prayer of the heart assumes the form mainly of the Jesus prayer. Jesus' prayer, which has been more and more disseminated nowadays in both uh, among individuals and religious groups, especially among Catholics, Christian Orthodox, and Anglicans. And the perennial philosophy has contributed to the revival of interest in prayer of the heart especially through the writings of Fritz of Schuon. Fritz of Schuon has written uh, important pieces about prayer of the heart and also other perennialist writers, Titus Burkhardt, Martin Links, William Stoder, James Kutzinger, Rama Komaraswamy, Jean Ani, and others have written about uh, prayer of the heart. Before uh, proceeding further, let's uh, have a look in what uh, Schwam himself wrote about the different types or modes of prayer. According to Schwam, there are three main types of modes of prayer. Canonical prayer, personal prayer, and prayer of the heart. Canonical prayer is the common prayer to all faithful of a, a, a given religion. So in Catholicism, the Pater Noster and the Ave Maria are the most well-known canonical prayers. Uh, the Lord's Prayer and the Hail Mary. And in fact, they are traditional prayers and in fact, even more than that, reviewed prayers as the Paternoster was first uh, said by our Lord himself, and the Ave Maria is based on the angelic salutation, which means the own words of God. The second category or mode of prayer, according to Fritz of Schuon, is personal prayer, which is free and spontaneous communication between man and God. The, the Psalms of David are a good example of personal prayer. And then we have prayer of the heart. Prayer of the heart, uh, which is, has as its subject, not the individual, properly speaking, but the heart. That is something that transcends us. And uh, the subject of canonical prayer is man as such, the human being. And the subject of personal prayer is the individual. Uh, Shuon discusses this matter of three kinds of prayer in this book here, Letters of Fritz of Shuon, which was edited by Michael Fitzgerald, and uh, published this year. If someone wants more 
information about this, he, can, he or she can have it here. And also there is a book by Fritz of Schoen called Stations of Wisdom, which deals with uh, prayer of the heart and the modes of prayer. And uh, the center or the, or the heart of prayer of the heart is the divine name. In the case of Christianity, it is the name of Jesus. It is a revealed name. It's not a human name. It was a name given by heaven, not by man. So this man is so, this name is so powerful that St. Saint, Saint Paul was able to say that under this name, every knee bends in heaven, in earth, and below earth. And also an Eastern mystic once said that God and his name are one. Another uh, mystic said the name is the name it. The name is the name it. In prayer of the heart, man is closer to God than his jugular vein, as an Easter tradition also puts it. That's right. <laughs> In prayer of the heart, God, God is closer to man than his jugular vein. And according to Fritz of Schuon, in the end, prayer of the heart is our deepest center. It's our best act. It is our refuge and, in fact, a door to our salvation. The Spanish playwright Calderón de la Barca once wrote a play called La Vida es Sueño, Life is a Dream. And Shuon commented, life is a dream and to pray is to awaken from this dream. So we see here that the perennial philosophy and Christianity speak with a common voice. For both of them, prayer of the heart is the heart of prayer. Now I turn to another subject, not more on the level of praxis, but of theory. And uh, I would like to answer an important point, which is why believing intellectuals do not believe the perennial philosophy. Why believing intellectuals do not believe the perennial philosophy? By believing intellectuals, I mean theologians, philosophers, novelists, writers, artists, poets. It's the, uh, a very ample uh, approach to the, to the concept of believing intellectuals. In fact, one of the most unpalatable ideas of the perennial philosophy is its profound and far-reaching critique of the modern world and its rehabilitation of ancient cultures. René Guénon exemplified this position by the perennial philosophy in his book, The Crisis of the Modern World, which was written a century ago, in the, 20, in the 1920s. Guénon said that a compromise between the modern world and spirituality and metaphysics and religion is impossible. Any compromise between religious and modern mentality would weaken the first and only benefit the second, whose hostility would not be diminished by this since modernity aims at the total annihilation of everything in humanity that reflects a reality superior to itself. 
as you, you can see in this uh, slide. Let's also quote a Catholic author, Georges Bernano, who lived in my country during the war. On ne comprend rien à la civilisation moderne si l'on n'admet pas d'abord qu'elle est une conspiration universelle contre toute espèce de vie intérieure. Modern civilization, for Georges Bernano, is a conspiracy against the inner life. Now, a perennialist writer, Titus Burkhardt, he speaks of a capitulation of traditional cultures to modern technology. In Christian countries, modern technology corrodes religion. Every day we see some compromise, some concession made by church dignitaries to a greater openness to the modern world in what it has of essentially agnostic and practically anti-religious. The science that created the machine enjoys such extraordinary prestige that many are tempted to agree with it, even in areas where it is utterly incompetent. Let's focus now in this point for a moment. Why this is so? Following a clue left by a contemporary perennialist writer, Michel Clermont, in his book, L'Horizon Divin, The Divine Horizon, my question concerns Christian thinkers or believing intellectuals. In spite of the fact that perennialists have always been staunch defenders of the spiritual message of the Christian religion, they point to a profound compatibility between the tenets of the perennial philosophy and the beliefs and the spiritual practices of the Christian tradition. Fritz of Schuon, in particular, contributed with original and far-reaching visions and insights to an impressive renovation of, uh, renovation of the understanding of the legacy of the Christian tradition. In fields such as the spiritual dimensions of the clothes we wear, the music we listen to, the houses we inhabited, the art we contemplate, and even the transcendent dimension of sexuality and its place in our spiritual life, as we discuss in this book here, Alchemy of Love, Sexuality, and the Spiritual Life. These are some of the important topics in which the powerful and original approach of Schwann was exercised. Fathoming the depths of the religion and showing his deep love and knowledge of Christian spirituality. As well as the power of attraction of the perennial philosophy upon several intellectuals. Men who have embraced in greater or lesser measure the perennialist message. Harry Old Meadow, here present, C.S. Lewis and T.S. Eliot from Protestantism, Bernard Kelly, Angus MacNab, Wolfgang Smith, Thomas Merton in Catholicism, Jean E., James Kutzinger, Philippe Scherrard in the Orthodox Church, not forgetting the fascinating figure of Simone Weil, who was Jewish by birth, but can be considered a Christian Platonist. She also was influenced by uh, the, the perennial philosophy. Interestingly enough, some of Schwann's pages gives us the impression that they have been written by a Christian, advancing arguments in favor of the truth of Christianity, as Professor Antoine Favre of the Sorbonne said once. Even so, the perennial philosophy is still not sufficiently known. And if known, it is neglected or discarded by many intellectual believers. What are the reasons for that? Perennialist rejection of the modern Weltanschauung 
and the superstitions of progress and evolution have a metaphysical foundation. It's not merely a question of sociology or history. The, per the perennialist criticism is uncompromising, showing that humanity is presently living at a time of unprecedented intellectual, spiritual, religious, and moral decadence. Given its centrality for the perennial philosophy, let's see for a moment the meaning of metaphysics. To simplify things, one could say that metaphysics is a synthesis of the wisdom of all civilizations. It is the quintessence of what the great religious traditions have taught. Imagine that each religious tradition is a color. Christianity would be red, Islam green, Buddhism blue, Hinduism orange, and so on and so forth. Metaphysics would be the uncolored light. It is distinct from theology in the sense that theology is particular to a given tradition. Catholic, Catholic theology, Protestant theology, Islamic theology, so on. While metaphysics is universal, not limited to a given culture. That's a, a definition of metaphysics by a great Catholic saint and thinker, St. Thomas Aquinas. Metaphysics is the capacity man have of seeing things subspecies eternitatis, as he wrote in the Summa Theologica, to see things under the light of eternity. Metaphysics is not a religion, as Schwann explained, but it brings deep and universal meaning to the ideas and phenomena of religion. When our Lord said, what does it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and loses his own soul? Jesus is expressing in a language accessible to all men a metaphysical principle, that is, of the vacuity of everything that is not the only needful thing. As Matthew said in his Gospel 16, 26. The metaphysician and the perennialist is essentially a metaphysician perceives in the effects the cause, in the projections the archetypes. He sees in manifestations the principle with the loss of metaphysics in the modern West, the starting point and scope of most Western thinkers have become discrepant from before the modern pe period and also from that of other civilizations. Now back to my uh, main question. Why believing intellectuals do not believe the perennial philosophy? In my opinion, the main factors are belief in the notion of progress. This is perhaps the greatest idol of the modern world. Even with all the misfortunes of the 20th century, wars, wars, weapons of mass destruction, pollution, enviro environmental degradation, psychic unbalance, totalitarian regimes, repetitive and machinistic forms of words, and many other, many other problems, the myth of progress remains strong. Believing intellectuals are not immune to it. Of course, there are some exceptions. C.S. Lewis, T.S. Eliot, Thomas Merton, Simone Weil, but they are a minority. Lack of knowledge of the doctrine of temporal cycles is a second reason. In particular, lack of knowledge of the concept of cyclical decay, as expounded, for example, by Hindu wisdom.
According to Hindu wisdom, humanity goes from excellence to decadence and finally to corruption and inversion of values. From the golden age to the iron age through silver and bronze ages before reaching a tragic end. The doctrine of the four ages informs us of an inevitable process of decay. From more harmonious and happier times in the beginning of the cycle to a final epic of extreme corruption and suffering. Each age is linked to the dominant influence of one of the fundamental human types according to Indian spiritual anthropology, that is, contemplatives, Brahmins, warriors, Kshatriyas, middle class, Vaishas, workers, Shudras. A third factor for the refusal, for the refusal of uh, believing intellectuals in, in embracing the perennial philosophy is that the modern world is seen as one epic or period among many others. And one such period will be followed by another in an indefinite succession of more or less equal periods. For instance, during the 13th and the 14th centuries, the Mo Mongol invasions, invasions destroyed much of Europe and Asia, but eventually the Mongols were stopped and over the years, things returned more or less to the previous patterns. But this not apply to the modern world, as C.S. Lewis showed in his book, The Abolition of Man. The destructive power of the modern world is immense, overwhelming, and in the end, total. Now, one action taken today can have tragic consequences for dozens of generations. It's not anymore like the time of the Mongols. Finally, it must be also be said that Christian intellectuals in general have been hypnotized by the technological exploits of our materialistic civilization. It's quite difficult to conceive of life without these achievements on which almost all of us have become dependent. In fact, maybe these intellectuals are not as believers as they think. This reminds me of what a friend said. What many Christian intellectuals lack the most is simply to be a Christian. What many Christian intellectuals lack most is simply to be a Christian. This means a spiritually alert person. To be spiritual, not only in the mind, reading books, and going to church once in a while, but being spiritual with one's whole being, as our Lord himself taught in the Sermon of the Mount. One knows the tree by its fruits. This is the teaching of Christ. The fruits of the modern Weltanschauung are very far from being sweet, to say the very least. We should always have this crucial saying in mind. One knows the tree by its fruits. It is a fundamental criterion for evaluating our modern world. Thank you. I'm going to try to keep this short, shorter than I planned. Um, I've got about six pages single spaced here. I have no, I, ho, no idea how long it would take to read through all of this. I didn't have time. I just finished it this morning. Uh, so I'm going to do my best to just kind of pick and choose what I've written. And maybe I'll end up with 10 minutes or 15 minutes, hopefully not more than 20 minutes. So anyway, I want to introduce you to Father Bede Griffiths. Uh, he goes, he went by three different names. You know, you can call him Bede Griffiths or Father Bede or just plain Bede. He was very, very relaxed around everyone. He had no, he had no pride. He was a man without ego, a man who had no, no selfishness in him. He was a, he was a great saint. You know, I was, I was very influenced by him uh, in my own early Christian development. I, I grew up without religion altogether, so 
uh, discovered Father Bede after I discovered Thomas Merton, which is another point I want to make. One of the things you can say about Thomas Merton, I'm sorry, one of the things you can say about Bede Griffiths is that he might, I, I call him the second most well-known and influential Catholic monk of the 20th century. Um, the number one person, of course, is Thomas Merton, which would mean that Bede Griffiths is kind of a distant second, because there's nobody who really comes close to Merton and his influence on, on different kinds of people. Uh, in any case, um, he's influential because of his writings. His writings were directed to a broad audience. His writings were about spirituality, but especially about what we as Christians, we who are Christian, stand to gain by our exposure to other religions, in particular to Hinduism. And so that was really the one religion he was most interested in outside of Christianity. And his, his examination of Hinduism led him to conclude that the deepest truths of the religions are complementary. Each completes what is lacking or underdeveloped or maybe totally absent in the other. And he did this in a very convincing way. He made the idea of non-duality in Hinduism uh, very, very attractive and insightful, making us want to know more about what we are overlooking when we're thinking about God's relation to the world. Uh, even Karl Rahner, who was uh, influenced by non-duality toward the end of his life, Karl Rahner, in case you don't know, is a pretty big Catholic theologian in the 20th century. And he said Christians very often have this understanding thinking about God's relation to the world, in order to preserve God's transcendence, they imagine that God is far away from the world. And, and we make, on, on the board in class, they make a big circle for God and a small circle for, this, for the world. They say, well, how does that work and not work? And they always get it right. They say, well, that kind of separates the two, which is good. But you can't put a big circle around God. So we have to erase the circle. That, that leads them to this awareness that we really can't understand the mystery of creation. And non-duality, according to Bede and Karl Rahner and others, is a, is a Hindu way of approaching this mystery of everything being from God, pervaded by God, and not to be confused with God at the same time. So that was all very, very stirring for me to hear this. Um, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. I wasn't planning on approaching it this way. But anyway, um, one of the things that um, is characteristic of Bede also in terms of his life, his lifetime in the UK, is that he had fallen away from his Anglican faith. By the way, Trent, when did I start? What time did I start? 5.36. 5.36, OK. All right. So, so, so Father Bede, you know, um, very bright fellow, goes to Oxford, studies among, among other people. He studies with C.S. Lewis, very, very big name in the Western Christian world. And he and C.S. Lewis returned to Christianity at the same time. C.S. Lewis is by far more famous than Bede Griffiths is. But when C.S. Lewis wrote his book, Surprised by Joy, who did he dedicate it to? Bede Griffiths. He dedicated it to his friend Bede Griffiths. Bede himself, the year earlier, 1954, had uh, written a book about his own conversion um, called The Golden String. And basically, he's arguing there are certain times in our life whether we're raised with religion or not, when, when, when there's a breakthrough of the eternal into the temporal realm. And one of the things that he does early on in his book, he talks about what it was like as a schoolboy. He liked to go for long walks. He was always a solitary kind of a fellow. One day, he's walking through the, through the fields, and he comes before, before some hawthorn trees in full bloom. It's close to sunset. And He's suddenly overwhelmed by the intensity and the beauty of birdsong, of the beauty of the hawthorn trees, and of the deep peace of dusk. And he goes on his knees, and he begins to pray. He doesn't know who he's praying to, but he feels his need to pray. Later on, he calls that cosmic revelation, the revelation of God in nature. He goes on to talk about revelation also being God in the soul. So cosmic revelation is the God's natural um, presence to the world in many different ways, starting within the nature and in, and in the human soul. And then he talks about um, revelation given to the many different religions that are complementary. And that they all have in common, with all their differences, they all have in common this understanding that there has to be a breakthrough into the higher awareness and a breakthrough into the recognition of the eternal realm. Um, 
always, we're always in the present of that eternal reality, that mystery. But in order to do this, to have eyes to see, we need to be aware of what's wrong with us. We need to be aware of how we carry around something like a mental filter governed by the ego, in which we become entangled with the world through our cravings and our fears. And so the great world religions tell us, as a commonality, don't do that. Look what's going on. This is why you're so unhappy. And then they give us guidance, and they give us doctrines, but especially spiritual guidance, to help us to overcome that ego, which is the pro problem and the cause of so much suffering. So anyway, that's something that he recognized pretty early on. During the time when he had fallen away from Christianity, he did some reading in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Taoism. And he realized there's something here. He didn't know how to put it in relation to Christianity, but he knew there was something there. And so when he returned to Christianity, he knew he had to pursue this again, what he had left behind in his early search. And off he goes to India. And the way he puts it is, well, officially, he was in India to start an ashram, to start a monastery in, in India. I don't remember all the details of that story. But he also said, I'm going to India to recover or discover the other half of my soul. Because the Christianity and Christian culture of England of this, that period of time, you know, 100 years ago, had lost that sense of the, of the sacred mystery present in nature, for example and certainly had no interest in hearing about the presence of God in other religions. So anyway, um, he goes to India, and one of the things that he does is he starts to talk about non-duality. Now, I, have to, I understand. I'm looking at Swamiji here, who's a big master of this kind of understanding, I would guess, of non-duality. The word, the word non-duality is, is used all the time nowadays, and it means a lot of different things. But, but what, what Father Bede is doing is he's talking about a relationship with God that is non-reciprocal. God in the world, the world at all times requiring the presence of God and the power of God to exist, but God uh, not requiring the same. So the world is not an illusion, it's quite real, nor should there be a duality of the separation of the two. And, and he said this is a mystery that, that, that surrounds us, and pervades our being. And it has to do, again, with this perennial philosophy insight. So I'd like to say that, that non-duality is the metaphysic of the perennial philosophy in all of its forms. Now, another thing I'd like to add is that when Father Bede was in India, growing in his awareness of the wisdom of other traditions through his encounter with people of other religions, through the study of the scriptures, through his own meditation and prayer, uh, he was a very, very, um, very, very spiritually inclined person in his practices. He celebrated Mass every day, for example. But he did advocate both, the prayer, both prayer and meditation. Anyway, so when he's in India, one of the things that I discovered only later uh, is that there were other people as well in India who were also exploring the idea of non-duality and how it might relate to the Christian experience and Christian metaphysics. And these include such people as Raymond Panikar, who's probably known by a lot of people here, his importance. Another one would be Richard de Smet, whom not many people know, but in my mind, he's the greatest Christian thinker living in India in the 20th century. I had the good fortune of uh, surprising him very often by showing up in his room in the Jesuit, Jesuit seminary and saying things like, I still don't get it. Explain to me what Shankar is about. What is this thing called non-duality? He says, well, you know, in Aquinas, we have this thing called, called logical and real relations. And I said, I still don't get it. And he says, well, you'll get it eventually. He was very patient with me. But he's a very big person for trying to show how Shankar's teaching of non-duality can actually be harmonized with Christianity. But he's been, he's been uh, suspect or he's been accused by certain Hindus of actually wanting to read Christianity into Shankar, which, which may be true. I don't think that was his intent. Another person well known is Swami Abhishekthananda. Um, my favorite book on Swami Abhishekthananda is written by uh, Harry Oldmeadow, who's sitting there. Thank you very much for that wonderful book. And uh, another person who is known as a, another friend of Bede, who was studying the idea and, and immersing themselves in the experience of non-duality, was Sarah Grant, the Sacred Heart Sister from Scotland, with whom I, I lived about seven months in her ashram. So there's a lot of really important things going on there regarding non-duality. So why was it that Father Bede, and I was going to show you my outline. I haven't even done that. I have an outline to this talk, by the way. See, life and significance, Griffith's understanding of the perennial fossil, contemporary importance. Well, basically, 
uh, with number two, what I'm basically saying here is what I've already said, is that the awareness of the, of, of, of the eternal surrounding us, pervading us, present to us at all times, can help us to get beyond the enslavement to our lower awareness of who we are. I mean, the two always go together. You, when you start to understand what's wrong, then you're moving ahead already in the right direction. So, so Father Bede felt that the perennial philosophy had basically nailed what was wrong with the modern world. The focus on the lower self, the ego, that needs to be overcome is something that, that the world badly needed to know about. And so really there isn't much to be added here um, except that um, what, what, something else, I'm, I'm trying not to look at my notes, but something else here that he also says, Father Bede is kind of like James Kutzinger, who I've never met, but whose work I've been reading lately. And he says, we're not saying, the perennial philosophy is not saying that all these religions have a common insight, a common metaphysical insight. He makes a distinction between good religions that help to purify and bring us to spiritual maturity and other ones that don't. And Father Bede makes the same distinction, except he puts it differently. He says, there's always the danger of the demonic finding its way into religion and not just in the world in general. So we have to be aware of that as well, of how things can go badly wrong in religions that claim wisdom, but on the other hand, there's something uh, you know, ant antithetical to true spirituality that's going on here. Um, so again, we've been hearing now about this intellect within us, you know, the intellectus, this, this connection to the divine. Father Bede was very big about that as well. He said, that's certainly true. It's a commonality across the religious spectrum that we're not just body and soul, we're body, soul, and spirit. He used the word spirit when he talked about uh, intellect in this way. Now, come, I come to the third part, which is the most important part. I'm gonna try to keep it real short here. And that is um, to recognize, and James Kutzinger has written about this quite remarkably, um, the problems of trying to reconcile Christian teaching with the perennial philosophy. Okay, so I'm gonna go back here because I don't want to go too far ahead yet on my, what I have here. I'm gonna pull up some other things in a moment here. So now I'm gonna start reading because I might get it, I wanna make it as precise as possible, what I'm saying here. Um, can this teaching of many revelations and many spiritual paths be reconciled with the Christian teaching that all salvation is made possible only in Christ? Some years ago, James Kutzinger, himself a Christian and a perennialist, pointed out that Christianity has been largely hostile to the perennial philosophy. No question about it. And the main reason has just been named. Are there many ways to salvation as perennialism teaches, or is there only salvation in Christ? And what is meant by salvation in Christ? There's different ways of looking at that as well. If we focus on the historical Jesus as the source of all salvation, we face a difficult problem. How does salvation through Christ take place for people who've never heard of him, who maybe lived thousands of years before he existed? How, if, if salvation is possible to them, how has that been the result of something that is connected to Christ himself who's not yet appeared on earth? How can we make that kind of connection? And is this an example perhaps of theological overreach? of trying to say more than is actually warranted by the life of Christ. And we know that the early centuries of Christianity are gonna work with that question, and they're gonna come up with another solution, okay? So Kutzinger's solution was very much like that of Father Bede. The person of Christ is not limited to the historical Jesus. Drawing on the Gospel of John and on the doctrine of the early ecumenical councils of Christianity, Christ is understood to be the eternal word, the second person of the Trinity, through whom all things were made. This is from the letter to the Colossians in the New Testament. As such, Christ is the divine principle behind all revelation and the eternal source of salvation and every authentic tradition. In this sense, Christ is salvifically operative in and through non-Christian religions as well. So these are the words of Kutzinger, not of Father Bede, but it really does express Father Bede's understanding that Christ is at work everywhere in the world. This is also reminiscent of that famous book by Panikkar, The Unknown Christ of Hinduism, you see. Now, 
Um, I'm going to pull up a few more examples from Father Bede, where he gives such an emphasis to Christ that we're kind of taken, taken aback by it. Well, of course, I'm going the wrong way here. Here's what he says in three different books. The grace of Christ is present in some way to every human being from the beginning to the end. The words, in some way, I've put in italics because it's vague. Next, the grace of Christ through the cross, now we're focusing on Jesus of history, is offered in some way to every human being from the beginning to the end of time. Therefore, no one is outside the dispensation, the covenant of grace. I've again placed the words in some way in italics because it's kind of unclear. And then finally, he makes this amazing statement. I'm not sure what to do with it. Christ is ultimately the source of all religion. He is behind it all. I like to say God or the eternal mystery is, but B. Dever wants to separate that from God's revelation and Christ is the second person of the Trinity. So the question then is this, what does B. finally do when there is a conflicting truth claim? That means when there are not just differences between Christian doctrine and the doctrines of other religions that can be brought together in harmony, what about those doctrines, what about those doctrines that cannot be harmonized? What do we do now? We know there's a, a, a modern perennial philosophy approach that says, well, you know, everything is, is actually harmonized in the, uh, in the transcendent unity of religions. But here on earth, we really can't do this kind of thing. And we need not worry about it. Just follow your religion. Just follow your religion, you'll reach the goal. The problem is that today, we know about other religions. What do we think about those other teachings, right? So what, is, what does Father Bede say about this? And this is in the Cosmic Revelation, in which he talks beautifully and in a very inspiring way about Hinduism. The Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, the idea of love, how strong it is in Hinduism, that kind of thing. But then he goes on and says this. But this is early on in the book, but he doesn't develop it, and that's the problem. And where there is anything challenging, let it be tested. But when he says where there is anything challenging, he means where there are conflicting truth claims. Let it be tested by whether it is true to Christ and to what God has revealed in Christ and let us try to see other religions in their relation to him. Well, people are going to do that anyway in other religions. A Muslim is going to compare everything with what is known in the Quran. I understand that. But I'm just saying that, that Bede is not going to allow anything to actually compete in importance with God's revelation in Christ. And one of the reasons why he gives such attention, especially to, to Christ in the incarnation, he says, because something becomes very clear here now that is not always clear in other religions. And that is the affirmation of the infinite dignity and value of the human person and all their dimensions, including the body and the world as a whole and its materiality. He said this is something which has received a very, very positive affirmation by God in the revelation given to Christ. And this then also means, since we're talking about the body, we're also talking about injustice and oppression in the world. And so Bede is very much behind the idea of liberation theology. He, he told me personally once, that Gustavo Gutierrez is the greatest theologian in the world. He didn't say greatest liberation theologian. He said the greatest theologian in the world, period, because he's talking about transforming not only the human heart, but human society to bring about the kingdom of God where justice rules. See? So anyway, that's, where, that's how I understand Father Bede, what he's doing. He never really approaches all of this in a very systematic way, which I, I wish he had done, to answer some of the questions that I still have about his ambiguities the way he refers to Christ, sometimes it sounds like the Christ of history, sometimes it sounds like the second person of the Trinity, and I know those two always go together, but the way he does it, sometimes he's focusing on one more than on the other, and I'm a little bit confused about what he's doing. So anyway, in, in conclusion. Okay, 20 minutes. Okay, um, is Beat Griffiths a perennialist? Yes, he says so himself, but it is a Christ-centered perennialism. Bede does not give all revelations equal value and importance although each has the capacity to reveal something of the eternal mystery for those who follow that religion's precepts and guidance. But for Bede, it is the revelation of God in Christ that most clearly affirms the value of the world and the dignity of the human person. It is God's intent to transform the world in every way and to integrate it into the divine life. It is divine love, finally, active in the world that has the last word. For me, the, the key to Father Bede's thought is the, the love of God. And toward the end of his life, he had this powerful experience. He said it almost killed him. He was being so overwhelmed and crushed by divine love. 
that he could hardly speak. And he came out of the experience and he said that the, now the dualistic, ego-centered awareness is gone forever. But what remains is the love. And he says the thing we need to realize is that when we're close to death, love is waiting for us. Okay. Thank you very much, Brad, for uh, organizing this conference, for inviting me to it. And it's really a delight to follow uh, your presentation because some of the things that I will bring up uh, touch on what you have said also. And as I said, thank you for organizing this conference. Perennial philosophy is one of those topics that intellectuals don't dare to touch. I think it's sort of always sort of underground in our thinking, but we would never thematize it or, or admit that we are perennialist. So it's good to, uh, to be able to think about it together and, uh, and see what we can learn from one another. Um, I will uh, focus on how perennialism has influenced comparative theology. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with comparative theology, I'll say a few things about that. Uh, uh, but the three points I will be making, three very, very uh, simple points, are first of all that perennial philosophy is a form of comparative uh, theology avant la lettre, that it's sort of an early form of comparative theology, that perennial philosophy is actually the ground of comparative theology, and thirdly, that perennial philosophy can also be a real obstacle to comparative theology. So those are the three points that I will be uh, making. First, a few words about comparative theology. Um, so we usually define comparative theology as, in Christian terms, faith seeking understanding, but always in dialogue with other religious traditions. So it's uh, a, a matter of see seeking the truth, and that's where comparative theology differs from comparative religion, where comparative religion is just mostly about understanding similarities and differences. Comparative theology really is about seeking the truth, uh, but in dialogue with other, uh, with other religious traditions. In my own work, I have made a distinction between confessional comparative theology and what I have called meta-confessional comparative theology. So the terms speak for themselves, I think. Com confessional comparative theology is a comparative theology that presumes or that builds on the uh, normative teachings of a particular religious tradition, whereas meta-confessional comparative theology tries to seek a truth beyond the particular teachings of any single religious traditions. So both types of comparative theology draw their sources from more than one tradition, but one remains grounded in the revelation, the texts, and so forth of a particular tradition, the other tries to go beyond any particular uh, tradition to develop a more universal truth. Um, and so uh, here you see already where the points of connection are between uh, comparative theology and perennial philosophy. And with perennial philosophy, I, I tend to use the definition of Huxley, who defined in the very beginning of his book, Perennial Philosophy, as, uh, perennial philosophy as quote, the metaphysic that recognizes a divine reality substantial to the world of things and lives and minds. The psychology that finds in the soul something similar to or even identical with divine reality. And thirdly, the ethic that places man's final end in the knowledge of the imminent and transcendent ground of all being. So these are the, this is really the first paragraph in his book, Perennial Philosophy. Um, that, uh, that shows you how close uh, perennial philosophy is indeed to uh, non-dualism and to, uh, to a form of searching for an ultimate truth beyond any particular religion. So perennial philosophy draws from the teachings of different religious traditions, and as we have heard already, mostly from the mystical traditions of various religions. Um, I'm sort of amazed at how much Huxley knew, and I don't know how he got all his sources together. Unfortunately, he didn't give any footnotes to, to his quotes from different religions, but it's really remarkable how much he really knew about other religions in the early 20th century when 
not that much was really known about different religious traditions. Um, so I would say that, uh, that perennial philosophy uh, rejoins what I have called uh, meta-confessional -com comparative theology. So uh, perennial philosophy tries indeed to find a truth beyond the particularity of all religious traditions. Um, it's not limited to any one particular religion or one revelation. Um, and both uh, meta-confessional comparative theology and perennial philosophy are very much grounded in a kind of non-dual understanding of ultimate reality. I would have to say, though, that meta-confessional comparative theology, what's sometimes called trans-religious theology or inter-religious theology, though, doesn't only focus on that transcendent unifying uh, reality, but also looks at, at the particulars of different religious traditions and focuses on particular questions like the nature of, uh, of the divine, divine embodiment or the nature of desire. So meta-confessional comparative theology still looks at particular religious questions, whereas perennial philosophy tends to go beyond all the particulars of, uh, of different religious traditions. What I find uh, fascinating, actually, about perennial philosophy is that, that it's, it tends to be practiced not so much by Christian theologians. And this is sort of a debate in comparative theology. Is comparative theology Christian, or is it mostly Christians and Catholics who do comparative theology? If we look at perennial philosophy, most perennial philosophers are not Christian or Catholic. And what's fascinating, in fact, and this is maybe a point of discussion also, is how many Muslim thinkers are perennial philosophers, from Shuan and Genon to Reza Shah Kazemi and, and so forth, and uh, many of you here present. Uh, so that's fascinating to me. And of course, many uh, Hindus and Buddhist thinkers are also perennial philosophers. So it's a kind of... Uh, way of, of affirming the universality of comparative theology as not something that's only done by, by Christian uh, theologians. My second point is that uh, perennial philosophy can be regarded as the grounds for comparative theology. Now, comparative theology, uh, for it to be meaningful and constructive, has to be based on some kind of relevance of the other religious traditions to oneself, or some kind of unifying ground for engaging other religious traditions. If each religion is seen as a monad completely separate from other religious traditions, there would be no point in engaging in comparative theology. So comparative theology does presume a kind of unifying uh, ground of all religious traditions. Um, and in the course of history, of course, that unifying ground was not often ad uh, admitted. Each religion was seen as the enemy of the other, and, and uh, thinkers did not often look for what, what uh, unified religious traditions. And so perennial philosophy really gave uh, an opportunity for theologians to look a little beyond that kind of animosity or antagonism between religions and really recognize that there was indeed something beneath or, or beyond the religious differences that religions had in common. So I do think that perennial philosophy and in particular, of course, the focus on mysticism as the unifying ground has been very important for comparative theology. Um, and we heard already se several comparative, uh, or you can call them, I don't know if they're full-blown comparative theologians, but they're really pioneers of comparative theology. People like Panikar, Abhishek Tananda, B. Griffiths, Massignon, um, uh, Lynn de Silva, uh, Oshida in Japan, and so forth. So many of the early 20th century or mid-20th century pioneers of interreligious relations and comparative theology, we're all focused mostly on mystical themes. Um, so their interest was really in that area of common ground of mysticism between uh, of, of different religions. So that was sort of what we call in comparative theology or comparative religion, sort of the tertium comparationis, the, the common ground on the basis of of which one could then explore further similarities and, uh, and differences. 
uh, you know, people like Rudolf Otto also. I can, I can multiply the names. It's really kind of uh, staggering how many uh, early thinkers in this field were focused all on this area of mysticism or drew from mysticism as the ground for unity between, uh, between different religions. However, I'm, I'm not quite as sanguine as, as some others. Well, I, I will give you some examples of how Merton, indeed, for example, can be seen as, as an example of perennial philosophy. But I don't think he went all the way with perennial philosophy. And so let me give you some examples. So here is where he might be used as an example of perennial philosophy. When he says, quote, famous quote, the deepest level of communication is not communication, but communion. It is worldless. It is beyond words, and it is beyond speech, and it is beyond concept. Not that we discover a new unity, we discover an older unity. My brothers, he's speaking to other monks. We are already one, but we imagine that we are not. And what we have to recover is our original unity. What we have to be is what we are. So here, clearly, he, he emphasizes the unity uh, between um, the experiences of monks in different religious traditions. Then he says, without asserting that there is a complete unity of all religions at the top, the transcendent mystical level, that they all start from different dogmatic positions to meet at the summit, it is certainly true to say that even where there are irreconcilable differences in doctrine and in formulated belief, there may still be great similarities and analogies in the realm of religious experience. So here he admits this unity of religions, but then in other places he says this, it must certainly be said that a certain type of concordist thought too easily assumes as a basic dogma that the mystics in all religions are experiencing the same thing and are all alike united in their liberation from the various doctrines, explanations, and creeds of their less fortunate co-religionists. This has never been demonstrated with any kind of rigor, he says. And though it has been persuasively advanced by talented and experienced minds, we must say that a great deal of study and investigation must be done before much can be said on this very complex question. Since the personal experience of the mystic remains inaccessible to us and can only be evaluated indirectly through texts and other testimonials, it is never easy to say with any security whether what a Christian mystic, a Sufi, and a Zen master experience is really the same thing. So here you see his ambivalence about the question of the unity of mystical uh, experiences. Um, so, I think still this ambiguity may still allow comparative theologians to build on uh, the unity of mystical texts, but I don't think it's necessary for comparative theologians anymore to build only on that notion of mystical unity. And in particular, I think in the past 50 to 70 years, most religious traditions have developed from within themselves a kind of theology that can form the basis for comparative uh, theology. So a kind of theology of religions that makes sense of the idea of, of religious diversity and that allows a religion to open itself up to other religious traditions without necessarily jumping to this mystical unity of religions. So, I mean, very concretely in the Christian tradition, the Trinity has been very useful, you can say, or very instrumental in developing a kind of open openness to other religious traditions, an inclusivism or a pluralism uh, that allows for, uh, for openness to other religious traditions. So here we move a bit further into the question of whether uh, perennialism is indeed always helpful for comparative theology, and I would say Sometimes it is, but sometimes it can also be an obstacle for comparative theology. And in what sense, in particular, comparative or perennial philosophy has tended to make a very strong distinction between the transcendent mystical experience and the teachings and practices in which those experiences have been ex expressed. And what perennial philosophy does typically is sort of denigrate the particularity of teachings and practices 
in favor of this transcendent, uh, ineffable, apophatic union uh, of all religious traditions. So this kind of radical distinction, as Shuan puts, puts it, between exoteric and esoteric religions, or exoteric and esoteric uh, religions, sort of diminishes or denigrates the particularity of religious traditions, and therefore is not quite as, uh, as helpful or as, as useful for, uh, for comparative theology. Um, uh, another problem in, in uh, perennial philosophy is that it doesn't really offer too much by way of concrete criteria by which comparative theology may engage in, uh, in studying other religious traditions, other than what is true is only the reference to this transcendent reality. Uh, or this reflection of that transcendent experience. And, and with that, there's not much to engage the particular teachings and practices, whether they are true or valuable or interesting or not. It's all sort of always referring directly to that uh, transcendent experience. And comparative theology, you know, it, it, it's a very demanding discipline that requires sort of intensive study of the particularities of other religious traditions, of the languages and the teachings and the text of other religious traditions. And the kind of perennialist denigration or diminution of, of the particularities of these religions, I think, are a problem in, for uh, comparative, uh, comparative theology. One problem I personally have with uh, perennial philosophy is that it tends to place itself above the self-understanding of religious traditions. So it tends to reject all of the self-understanding of religion, and especially the claims to absoluteness of any particular religious traditions, and places itself above all these uh, different religions. One of the popular images, of course, uh, of perennial uh, philosophy is, is uh, or the way it understands diversity of religions is the story of the blind man and the elephant and every religious tradition just describing one part of the elephant. My question is always, who knows that it's an elephant? So I think the perennial philosopher knows that it's an elephant and, and regards all the religious descriptions of, of, the, uh, of the animal as lesser than what the perennial philosopher themselves sees. So that's, I think, uh, one of the problems of perennial philosophy, whereas comparative theology is, in that sense, less arrogant or a bit more humble in that it recognizes that we can only approach the absolute through the particularities of our teachings and practices and we have to open ourselves up, indeed, to being enriched by other religious traditions, but we don't put ourselves beyond any particular religious tradition. So those are the main points that uh, I wanted to raise, and I just will formulate briefly my conclusion. So the relationship between perennial philosophy and comparative theology is thus ambivalent. On the one hand, perennial philosophy opened the way to a greater appreciation of other religious traditions and a greater recognition of the partial or imperfect nature of religious doctrines and practices by pointing to a transcendent unity of religions and mystical experiences. This was an important alternative to the absolutist and exclusivist self-understanding of religions. It generated both greater openness to other religious traditions and greater humility about one's own religious claims. There is also much that rings true in the refrain, in Huxley's refrain, that the ultimate experience can only be discovered by those who make themselves loving, pure of heart, and poor of spirit. That it is only by annihilating the self that union with God can be achieved, and that saints in all religious traditions are astonishingly alike, as he puts it. While all this is necessary for comparative theology, too much humility may always also thwart comparative theological initiative. If all religious teachings and practices are merely partial and fallible expressions of a deep mystical experience which is present in all religious traditions and which can never be fully expressed or improved upon through human expression, then comparative theology may seem like a fool's errand or a futile pastime. 
One may compare the text teachings and practices of different religious traditions, but none, uh, but none of this would ultimately matter. All believers and theologians need to do is to turn to their respective mystics, or at most to the mystics of other, mostly Asian traditions. While comparative theology may thus be grateful to perennialism for opening the way to greater openness to and respect for other religions, it cannot fully embrace perennial philosophy without jeopardizing its own work and sense of purpose. Thank you very much. I think we have time for some questions. I would like to know um, from which ground you say, when you say that Richard Schwann, he doesn't give um, importance to the particular, particularity of each religion, but only to the transcendence. Mm -hmm. Because I, in, he has written extensively in different traditions uh, the, the form of the religion, which is very important to access the transcendence. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand which is the fundament of this. Thank you. I, you're right. I mean, he doesn't deny that that the particularities are important, but he he does never he does not recognize religions in their full self understanding. So the religious claims to ultimacy, for example, he radically rejects. Um, and and in his, as far as I understand him, in his work, he often draws a kind of radical contrast between exoteric and esoteric religiosity and that kind of transcendent unity which requires a kind of degradation um, of particularity. As per my understanding, I think he says that we can attain the transcendence only through a particular religion and follow it formally. Yeah. So um, there is no kind of um, distinction of exoterism and esoterism. Uh, there is a proper exoterism that should be um, understood and practiced, but the aim is to reach exoterism. Right. So I don't think that there is a disconnection, but there is one that leads to the other. Right. I think you're right about that, but insofar as religions also claim to be ultimate and unique, he, he would have rejected that. And that's sort of part of the path of, of religions to what each religion regards as the ultimate experience. So certainly he rejected the claims to uniqueness uh, of, of each religious tradition. And I was just reading it uh, a little while ago again, so I, I'm pretty uh, clear about that aspect. And so, so there's an ambivalence. You need religions to reach that experience, but not fully in the way religions understand themselves. Yes, see? but in my understanding, uh, he doesn't reject uh, religion as such because he makes a point that it's only through religion as such that we can uh, uh, reach uh, exoterism. So he can never don't accept it, it would be a contradiction. Yeah, yeah. So again, I, I think he recognizes the importance of exoteric religio religiosity also. So I agree with you. Yes. But you see, the, the point I'm making is that he interprets religions and the religious path on the basis of that transcendent unity, not in terms of that the religion sees for itself. <laughs> I think if he would do it, he would not follow. Because if he accepts uh, and if, if he gives so much importance to the formal aspect of a given religion, is because he knows that it's only through it that he can transcend. But as he, uh, he is talking from a higher point of view, 
her discourse may be such that seems that he's higher and he's not grounding, but it would be a contradiction to develop, and mostly because he has developed so many different traditions and so deeper that he has enough ground to know that all these uh, different traditions has a particular form and through only one you have to choose to transcend it. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't understand still how can you um, perceive uh, him not being grounded on the truth of one unique religion. Mm -hmm. Each one, I mean. I, th I think we'll hear more about this tomorrow. We have a paper on Shuan, right. and I'm sure Thank you Perry so will much. explain that. <laughs> can, can I add something just to follow? Can you hear me okay with this? Yeah. Uh, if I understand your objection, and I'm with you, is that it does seem, and I'm not someone who knows Shuan's work very well, it seems to me he's, he's basically saying that the perennialist understands better what a particular religion is really about than the followers of that religion themselves, even though the path they take will lead them to the goal. But he, he sees the big picture. They don't see the big picture. That's how I understand. Mm -hmm. Can I? Can I try go to the <laughs> so what I was thinking is that you brought this comparison of the elephant in a dark room which is a sort of comparison, but there's also the comparison of the wheel with the spikes, and it all leads to the center. So there is no, um, it, there's no misleading of, uh, you only understand this part, there's a complete uh, perfection in each spike, because it goes to the same place. So um, from that point of view, they are obviously on different planes of the, of the wheel, but they lead to the same place. Mm -hmm. That's, in my opinion, what Sarah was trying to say. <laughs> you're, you're the moderator. Here's, uh, here's Adnan. Is it? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm very sorry. I didn't see you. I, I uh, yes, please. To the to one of the mics. Would I'm be. the moderator of the moderator. <laughs> So my question to Matthew is um, about uh, you know the religion is the colors red green so on and so forth. The, the metaphysics is the uncolored light. So this metaphysics uncolored light, how can you distinguish from the philosophical metaphysics? Me there is only one metaphysics. So this metaphysics must be very distinct from the let us say. Aristotelian or Platonic metaphysics? Thank you for your question. Uh, what I would uh, like to say is that each color conveys or transmits light, be it the red of Christianity, the green of Islam, or the blue of, of, of Buddhism. Everyone transmits the light through this color, but there is the uncolored light. That's the, the that's the point. That's the point. Uh, in essence, I don't see any difference. Plato. Uh, Fritjof Schoen, Genon, Titus Burkhardt, Martin Links, uh, Nasr, uh, were or have been all uh, Platonists. But they don't relate, they don't relate to religion. Platonists, they don't relate to religion. Like Schoen is doing. I, didn't, I did not understand the question. I mean, philosophical metaphysics is not based on religion. Well, not, not based visibly, but Plato, for instance, and Aristotle also read our religion. They were followers of the Greek religion, even despite they don't speak too much about them in their books. But they, they were religious people. They, would, they used to pray and to uh, do the, the rites of the Greek religion.
Thank you so much for your uh, wonderful uh, presentations. I, I'm interested um, in this question. I, I wonder if, you know, in sort of contrasting, as uh, Professor Cornier does, between the uh, sort of self-understanding and this sort of meta-religious uh, vantage point that, that's claimed, I mean, of, of course, as, as you well know, Professor Wright, I mean, the sort of the self-understanding in a way, right, we have to be careful, right, that we're not like, for example, if, if we speak of, you know, the Hindu self-understanding, right, that, as you well know, right, I mean, it's very perspectival, and it's, it's very, um, uh, like, in a way, you know, we're still seeing it through a different sort of Western construct of what each of these religions is. Uh, I mean, somebody like, you know, David Bentley Hart, whom we'll hear later in the conference, he, he would say, I don't believe in religions, I believe in religion. In a sense, like like religions, in a way, are a, a modern scholarly construct, right? Uh, and of course, you know, if you look in each tradition, in a way, each of them, I mean, there can be this sort of exclusive dynamic, right, where it's like there are different truths and they're just contradictory. But then a much more common, I think, and for me, I think it's very helpful, kind of is the sort of uh, hierarchy or the sort of incorporation, in a sense, like it's true, but but this is truer. Now, but then. You'll still debate about who's right about in that sense, right? But, you know, I mean, each school tends to see its own perspective as the summit in some way and the most ideal one from which to integrate the various perspectives. And it's, you know, I mean, you think of, uh, you know, from Advaita Vedanta or Kashmir Shaivism or within the Tibetan tradition, similarly, they have sort of um, hierarchies of vehicles internal to them. And that logic, of course, can be applied you know, interreligiously, that would be, uh, you know, and I guess that is often how, I, I, I think the challenge would be in a way that, that usually kind of other religions have been relegated sort of to the bottom of that. Uh, but, but, you know, to develop sort of a, a meta philosophy of religions, you know, you, you find a way so that, that that kind of gets you across that gap and you're, you're no longer obliged to sort of uh, sort them in that way. Um, but um, I, I, I guess um, I wonder, in a sense, like, like how, how how can we? You know, there there are so many complex questions that that one can can deal with. But but um, I, I think it's almost be prior to the question of comparing religions, right? I mean, because it, it, it all depends on what our telos is in a way, right? I mean. My, my, my question is, 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 is really, I mean, is there room within comparative religions exactly, f I mean, you said comparative theologies exactly for, uh, you know, sort of, like, uh, is the debate really whether you want to preserve kind of a view onto uh, truth that could be something uh, disclosed through particular traditions and not, um, uh, you, 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 you know, um, or... I think, uh, I think I know what you're yes. asking. So when Please. I made the distinction between confessional and meta-confessional comparative theology and meta-confessional comparative theology being actually very close to perennial philosophy, I, you know, we heard, you know, of, uh, John Hick and, and, and Nasser being on the stage together, I think, Actually, pluralism is also itself very indebted to perennial philosophy, and then pluralism is sort of the theological basis for a meta-confessional comparative theology. So I think there is a kind of philosophical open, I mean, possibility to speculate about a truth beyond all religious traditions, and people are doing that. That's sort of what meta-confessional comparative theologians are doing. So there is room for that, but I, I still, believe that the contradiction there is that those people depend on the self-understanding of religions to go beyond the religions themselves. So if there were no religions, there, there would not be any meta-confessional comparative theology either. You know? So they, on the one hand, depend on the religions, but they reject the religion's self-understanding, which, as you point out, always if not it ha starts from an exclusivist, at least starts from a sense of the superiority or the highest path of one's, or the fastest way to the ultimate reality, whatever every religion understands itself to be in some way, 
the highest uh, path. And I think that's actually necessary for religion, if you want to use it as a generic. If, if religion is about complete self-surrender mm. mm. or surrender of one's ego, you ha almost have to believe that this path that you believe, surrender yourself to is the ultimate path. Mm. So I believe that there's a very strong connection between the kind of ultimate claims of religious traditions and the possibility for complete self-surrender that is you know, a, a theme in all, in all religious traditions. So letting go of that, I think, is sort of a, a problem on various levels, both theologically and spiritually. Yeah. Thank you. Would I be able to pose a question to Dr. Cornell? Making sure it's coming through on audio rather than yes, chat. Yes, yes. Uh, sure, please yourself. go ahead. Perfect. Thank you guys so much for the conference, first and foremost. I very much have enjoyed it thus far. Um, I guess the question I'm ultimately trying to arrive at is Excuse me, could you introduce yourself? We Absolutely. I'm not sure who was up there. My name is Jake Furnish. I'm, uh, I graduated from Middle Tennessee State University for the Religious Studies program. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, so I have some understanding of uh, comparative mythology, comparative religion, which is a little bit more where I'm geared to. But looking at things from a comparative theological angle, I'm curious if there is, um, I guess, room to breathe for perennialism in its pure essence, kind of with this hierarchical truth value where things disseminate almost through like a prism into the various, you know, religions and, and esoteric traditions that we're all familiar with, uh, to where it isn't academic or intellectualized in such a way that the truth value is always being sought after in kind of the mundane sense. Because what seems to always be relevant in these discussions is the um, the rupture of the, the sacred into the realm of the profane is what is so emblematic and symbolic of the perennial philosophy. You know, it's this ineffable, unreachable truth value that is unified with and therefore understood, but cannot be adequately expressed because it is a sensation. And so I'm curious when looking at uh, perennial philosophy from the angle of uh, comparative theology, uh, where that kind of safeguarding of keeping perennialism true to itself can be helped space for. Thank you. Um, if I understand you well, and um, I don't know if I'm responding to what you're asking, but what I was pointing out was how some sense of unity of religions always forms the basis, a kind of metaphysical unity of religions forms the basis for engaging religious traditions. And that indeed, the intuition, I would say, of perennial philosophy is uh, to find that unity in the mystical traditions. And I think it's undeniable that there are all these similarities between both mystical paths and mystical fruits and so forth. Um, so, and as I said, in comparative theology, many of the of comparative theologians, of the early comparative theologians, were focused on, on mystical traditions. So there's certainly a lot there that, uh, that is fruit, food for thought. The, the only place where I have a problem and, or where comparative theology would have a problem with perennial philosophy is where it sort of relegates the teachings of the particular, the par particular teachings and practices of religions to a sort of lesser, lesser form of religious expression. Whereas um, from a comparative theological point of view, this is really all we have. All we have are the, the traditions in which that we belong to and to which we give ourselves. Um, and as Merton said, you know, we hope that there is a, a transcendent unity and there are a lot of arguments for it, but we just don't know. Um, so all we have ultimately are, uh, is the material, are the teachings and practices of our religions that we constantly try to enrich and deepen and, and expand through dialogue with other religious traditions. And that's what comparative theology is. 
So I think there is still sort of a place, I think, for uh, perennial philosophy, and, and I think we will always engage it implicitly or explicitly. But, but if we engage it too much, as I pointed out, it's the end of comparative theology. Uh, one more question here. Thank you. I feel like many of us are circling around an issue that I think a book uh, speaks to directly, which I want to just bring into the discussion. Robert McKim's On Religious Diversity. Has anyone read that book? I think 2012. How do you spell the name? McKim, M-C-K-I-M, Oxford University Press, I think 2012. And it's important, I think, for all of, I mean, if, I think we all seem to be circling on this issue of, well, even perennial philosophers seem to be committed to a kind of more comprehensive epistemic vantage point from which they can judge that all the different religious traditions kind of are, are equally good. And I think one very important distinction he makes, which is kind of the, it's throughout the book actually, is he distinguishes two different ways of cashing out the threefold typology, the rate Alan races, you know, exclusivism, inclusivism, and pluralism, one in terms of truth and the other in terms of salvation. That's crucial because I think what you're talking about the whole time is in terms of truth. And McKim's entire point is you have to prize these things apart because they're not, they don't logically entail one another. Pluralism with respect to truth does not entail necessarily pluralism with respect to salvation and vice versa. So now, regarding perennial philosophy, I take it that perennial philosophers typically bite the bullet on, on the accusation you're making and say, Yes, we claim to be occupying a more comprehensive epistemic vantage point in order to secure a robust and philosophically plausible salvific pluralism. That's what's crucial. I mean, for, for them, the important thing is all the different paths are equally capable of us taking to the highest goal of salvation. And, and they just value, because presumably people will care about that more than doctrine. Am I saved in the end? And am I, am I as capable of being saved in my religious tradition as I am in others? And just because I think you're all Catholic, am I right in thinking this? Or, or maybe I shouldn't presume that, but... Kind of. Okay, so, I, <laughs> so a related question is Nostra Aetate. I mean, this is something we haven't talked about explicitly, but it's th the official position of the Catholic Church seems to be now salvific and doctrinal inclusivism, it seems to be. And what perennial philosophy adds is they, all, they, they embrace a kind of doctrinal meta-inclusivism in order to, to secure a robust salvific pluralism. I don't. Yeah, so I, I made the same distinction actually between uh, in, uh, between epistemological and soteriological understanding of the three paradigms in in my own work. So I I don't have a problem with that, but it's it still doesn't get us out of the problem uh, that 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 perennialists still think that they know what the salvation is for all religious traditions. Right. Yeah. But but that that understanding of salvation still doesn't coincide with the religion's self understand understanding of salvation. Matthias, would you like to sum us up? Yes, I would, would like just to make a point to you that uh, I have been reading and studying the writings of Fritz of Schwann on the various uh, religious traditions. And uh, I don't see, or I didn't, I have not seen what you uh, commented here, because uh, I have read on Hinduism, Shuon wrote language of the self. On Islam, he wrote understanding Islam. On the tradition of the American Indians, he wrote the fettered son. On Buddhism, he wrote treasures of Buddhism. And on Christianity, he wrote this, Christianity and the Perennial Philosophy, and also James Kutzinger uh, edited a book called The Fullness of God. And in all these books, he never diminished any uh, particular religion. On the contrary, on the contrary. Then uh, I would take a stand different from you. <laughs> based on the reading and studying of all these books by Fritz Schofschum himself. Yeah. I mean, he recognizes the importance of religions, but like most perennial philosophers, he picks out what is true in each religion. 
right? So he, he picks out elements of Christianity, the prayer of the heart, elements of Hinduism. So perennial philosophers tend to focus only on those elements of different religions that confirm that transcendent unity of religions, which doesn't, doesn't deny that, that those elements are still there, but they have to, <clears throat> sorry, they have to leave behind <clears throat> a lot of the self-understanding of religion in order to make the point. You see what I'm saying? So there's a lot more to Christianity than just the mystical traditions or the prayer of the heart. <clears throat> and those don't really fit in a, a perennialist perspective. Do you want to yeah, sum to, up our... No, I don't want to summarize anything. That would be too hard. Uh, but I just want to point out, in my understanding, um, in, in pointing out the commonalities of spiritual striving and spiritual experience and the final goal, as I understand it, the, the perennials are basically saying it comes down to the bare minimum what they have in common, transcending ego, entering into that higher state. And I'm thinking that does not really reflect well the huge differences between the way the final goal is understood between the religions. That's clearly not enough what Christians mean by the final goal to say unity with God. There's so much more we have to say than that. And that's something that I think you'll probably be talking about tomorrow too. Looking forward to it. Okay. Let's thank our speakers. Thank you.